our study in the Gospel of Mark by looking together at the 13th chapter. And if you have a Bible there in front of you, I would encourage you to open it to Mark 13 and follow along as we share the Word of God together today. This is the third day in the final week of the Lord's ministry. The final week began in Mark chapter 11. On a Palm Sunday, the Lord triumphantly enters Jerusalem. The second day of that week finds him cleansing the temple on Monday. And Tuesday is called the day of controversy. I think in the Gospels there is more material related to that day, that single day, than any day of Christ's life. The day begins by the disciples noticing that the fig tree which he had cursed has withered. And it's really kind of a tip-off to the day. But that day is a day of withering. It's a day which portends uh, uh, just tremendous struggle. We see, for example, that immediately upon Jesus entering into Jerusalem, that he has asked questions, test questions. We see in the 23rd chapter of the Gospel of Matthew that following that, he gives an excoriating denunciation of the scribes and the Pharisees. And the day, then the day is culminated through the giving of the Olivet Discourse, or the Discourse on the Mount of Olives, which is found here in Mark chapter 13, a discourse which shows us the dark side of human history from man's point of view, but the bright side from the Lord's and from the Christian's point of view. We really have here a program of the future. And it is fascinating to go through the Gospel of Mark and note that prior to this time, Jesus had not systematically or in any length even taught the disciples about the future. In fact, they had been with him for two whole years before he began to systematically and plainly declare to them his approaching death and resurrection. There is a program in Christ's teaching method which simply says that as you become ready to learn more, he gives more. And probably we should keep that focus in mind that there are certain things about the kingdom of God in the present that the Lord wants us to learn before we become all caught up with the kingdom of God which is breaking in in the future. The occasion for the discourse comes as a result of Jesus and the disciples leaving the temple area. The temple area itself was a very large piece of land if it had been squared, it would have measured about a thousand feet on each of its sides. It, however, was not squared. There were buildings in the temple, beautiful columns and colonnades and the temple building itself. Some of the stones which had been used in building the temple were 37 feet long, 12 feet wide, uh, 18 feet in width. Uh, Josephus, the Jewish historian of the first century, gives us those dimensions. At the time of Mark chapter 13, this building had been in construction for 49 years. Actually, most of it had been built in an early time, but still work was going on. At one time, King Herod had had 10,000 skilled workmen employed in its building. Because of the nature of building the temple, the uh, manner of procedure under Solomon was that while the temple was in construction, there could be no sound of a hammer hitting stone or no sharp sounds within the temple. Therefore, everything had to be muffled. And as a result of that, these stones had been quarried out and cut exactly to dimension and laid in by the workmen of the temple. The, the stones, uh, the huge, massive stones weighing tons, some have estimated that some of the stones weighed as much as 100 tons, were uh, uh, white marble in composition and the temple building itself was flecked with gold. So that a pilgrim coming over into the city catching a first glimpse of this glistening temple on Mount Zion would gain an impression of a kind of a snow-capped mountain peak, the beautiful gold glistening on the white marble buildings. And it was a dazzling sight, an architectural engineering feat uh, of tremendous proportions given the fact that in those days they did not have the mechanical conveyances we do today to erect structures. So Jesus is leaving the buildings and the disciples point out to him as every person who had seen the temple could testify, look, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. Jesus then gives them the kind of the dropping of the shoe on the other foot in saying, you see all of these, there shall not be left one stone standing upon another. An incredible statement to make. 
Well, when the disciples are out on the Mount of Olives across the Kidron from the temple area, then four of them, Peter, James, John, and Andrew, come and ask Jesus privately what the significance was of his statement. And they really ask him a question as noted in verse 4, which it's very important to understand the nature of the question if we're to follow the flow of the teaching on the future that is recorded here in Mark 13. The question, first of all, is when will this be? That is, when will the temple come tumbling down? Jesus doesn't answer that question immediately. He proceeds to answer it in verse 14, which is middle way through the discourse, and his answer takes us through verse 23. The second part of the question is, what will be the sign of your coming? And that question is answered in verse 24 through verse 27. The third part of their question is, when all of these things are to be accomplished, or if we cross-reference with Matthew 24, we find that their question goes, and the close of the age. That is, they're asking, what will be the nature of the course of the age? What kind of things are going to be occurring? And Jesus chooses to answer that third element of their question first by the fact that we see this as his answer in verses 5 through 13 of the discourse. Now let's take those three questions which are asked him, or three parts to the questions, and break down the discourse. And as we do, I think you'll see that Christ's words become very easy and simple to understand. The first question has to do with the course of human history. Or that is the first question Jesus answers. What things are to be accomplished before the close of the age? On the negative side, Jesus indicates that four things are to happen. First of all, there's going to be trouble as far as religion is concerned. So that Jesus notes, for example, Many will come in my name saying, I am he, and they will lead many astray. First thing Jesus is telling the disciples is to have no naive assumptions that because his life has now been manifested, that the world is going to become an ecumenical grouping of faiths and that persons are going to give up their old alliances and pagan religions and false ideas of God and uh, crown Jesus as Lord within time as we know it. Instead, he sees a continuation of diversity within religious faith. And of course, from the first century until now, haven't we seen that continued pro, uh, proliferation of religions, the latest of which is uh, the Maharishi Yoga, I suspect, uh, would certainly be classified as one of those kinds of things, a phenomena which occurs saying, I am from God, I am Messiah, I am anointed. Jesus said to the disciples, this is going to be happening. The faith which I am bringing to the world will not be a faith that is received by all. So expect that kind of a thing to occur. Secondly, Jesus says that the disciples are to expect trouble in society. He says you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Now we've seen ample fulfillment of this. Will Durant, the modern historian, suggests that there have been uh, the last, out of the last 3,425 years of human history, that there have been wars between nations in all of those years except for 268 of the 3,425. So the condition of strife has been a part of man's existence from the beginning of human history, where we see Cain and Abel really struggling with one another. Now, we're 2,000 years nearly into that 3,425-year period. So when Jesus says that there is going to be continued strife within society, he is making a forecast. Things are not going to get better in society simply because he has appeared in life. Men will still continue to exist without God, and wars will continue to proliferate. In fact, in the last 60 years of human history, there have been 100 million persons who have lost their lives as a direct result of war. 100 million persons. The United States itself is an armed camp. If we would reduce the population of the world into a thousand people, put them in a kind of a global village, 60 of those 1,000 people would be Americans. And the 60 of us would spend per person 
three and a half dollars every year to help the other 940 people while we were spending $850 per person to defend ourselves against the other 940. Our situation in the world today is as if someone's hands were on a nuclear trigger. So we shouldn't at all be surprised when Jesus indicates in his program of human history there will be wars and rumors of wars, nations or ethnic groups against ethnic groups, black against white, Arab against Jew, and so forth. Ethnic associations, ethnos, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom, political grouping against political grouping. Jesus also indicates that there will be trouble as far as nature is concerned. And there are two manifestations of this, earthquakes and famines. Famines are caused for any number of reasons. Uh, lack of industriousness, lack of know-how, lack of rain, too little sun, too much sun, too much rain. All of these kinds of things can go into famines. And he says there will be earthquakes. Now, there were earthquakes in the first century, and there were famines in the first century, as there continue to be earthquakes and famines now. Jesus says when you see these conditions occurring, they are the beginning of suffering. The beginning of sufferings. Now, the word which Jesus uses for sufferings, as is seen here in Mark, is the word which can be translated birth pangs. Birth pangs. It is the word which is used to describe a woman who is in labor, about to give birth to a child. Jesus says when you see the kinds of natural disturbances, earthquakes and famines, then this is the beginning of the birth pangs. And indeed, one of the concepts of the entirety of history as seen from the scriptures is that this age in which we live, this era, is literally pregnant with a new age which is coming, the age of God. And the nearer the birth of the new age comes, the more convulsive will be the contractions of the old age. So that the earthquakes are a kind of visible reminder to those of us that live here on the San Andrian Fault or whatever kinds of faults we, we have here in Southern California, that the more we see these kinds of things take place, they are a tip-off to the kind of thing which will eventually culminate, seen later in the Olivet Discourse, where the sun, the moon, the stars themselves will be affected by tremendous catastrophe. So Jesus is really saying, as the course of human history keeps on moving, the contractions are going to become more and more severe until the new age is born. A fourth kind of a thing that Jesus indicates is going to be happening as far as trouble is, there is going to be trouble for the disciples. They're going to have opposition. They're not going to be received by everyone with open arms. They have trouble from religion, councils and synagogues. They're going to have trouble from governments. You'll be brought before kings and rulers. Uh, they're going to have trouble from their family. Brother will deliver brother, father, son, son, father. And they're going to have Opposition from indeed all men or society in general. What's Jesus doing here? He's saying to the disciples, get ready for the worst. He is not preparing them for some kind of push-button escape where they are being told they won't go through difficulties. He is saying on the dark side of the ledger that their faith in him is going to need to be so solid and so secure that it is going to be needed to be secure enough to the point even of family betrayal. And anyone in this room who has small children can't really picture that sort of betrayal happening. The sons and daughters that are yours now betraying you to authorities, to civil authorities or to religious authorities. Yet within the experience of the first century disciples and indeed on numerous occasions through the experience of the church, this very thing has happened. My parents as missionaries in China saw this thing happening after they had left with uh, with the kind of uh, insidious propaganda of, uh, against the Christians that was launched, family betraying family or betrayal within family. So these kinds of disastrous things are going to be occurring, and the faith in Christ, of course, is strong and solid so that it can successfully withstand any of that incredible pressure. On the positive side, Jesus says, the following, he indicates the gospel is going to be preached, verse 10, to all the nations, all the ethnic groups, 
Perhaps nation here shouldn't be understood by us to be every nation in the United Nations today because we have a different understanding of what constitutes a nation now than they did in the first century. What we're talking about here is grouping of people, ethnic grouping of people. And so far as the disciples were able to understand, in the first century they had fulfilled this. They didn't know the North American continent existed, so they weren't aware of that there. But they fulfilled it to the ends of the earth as they understood it. And today the gospel is going out to all nations. It does not say that all nations would have a penetration of saturation by the gospel, but that all nations or ethnic groups would hear. Furthermore, on the positive side, Jesus promises the disciples that the Holy Spirit will be with them, showing them in that hour what they are to say when they're brought before trial. Not an excuse for us who teach and preach to get up unprepared before audiences, but rather a way of saying that when you are caught in a jam where you have had no time to study or no chance and not knowing how to approach it, don't worry. Whatever you say in that hour is the Holy Spirit. And you have that confidence that you're not simply speaking your own words. And further he indicates on the positive side that the person who endures to the end will be saved. Salvation is possible. There will be those who will come through the most severe pressure for him and will endure. Even if it's Peter, as tradition says, going to Rome and uh, in humility, unwilling to be crucified as was his Lord, volunteers to be crucified upside down. He who endures to the end will be saved. So Jesus is certainly indicating from this that the disciples will remain true to him. So this is the program for human history. These conditions will occur. They're, they're the birth pangs of history. And they'll become more convulsive as the age progresses. Then Jesus, beginning with verse 14, begins to tackle the question of when will the temple be thrown down? This beautiful building which I have described at the beginning today. <clears throat> Jesus says in verse 14, When you see the desolating sacrilege set up where it ought not to be. Now, for reference to the desolating sacrilege, you would need to turn back to Daniel chapter 9 or Daniel chapter 11 or 12, which describe what a sacrilege would be in a prophetic kind of a way, that it would be someone doing something which would be idolatrous within the temple itself. And we see an initial fulfillment of that in 166 B.C., where a Syrian general a leader by the name of Antiochus Epiphanes comes into the temple area. He brings a pig in on the altar and sacrifices it. He has prostitutes brought into the temple area and defiles it through immorality. And he also works in destructive ways also in the temple. So there is a desolating sacrilege. Josephus, the first century Jewish historian, which I'll quote a little bit later again in another context, says that not only did Daniel prophesy and that Antiochus Epiphanes in 166 B.C. would desecrate the temple, but Daniel also saw that the Romans would do the same thing. And indeed, Josephus in 70 A.D. lived through the Roman siege of Jerusalem, which involved the Romans under the general Titus surrounding the city, cutting off its food supplies, cutting off its material, and for a period of about five months, putting... Uh, the city in an uh, excruciating situation where famine became so severe that people died like flies. Josephus describes that event, if I could find it here just a moment, in the following terms. He says, um, well, I had it here. Let me just look one second. Then did the famine widen its progress and devoured the people by whole families and houses. The upper rooms were full of women and children that were dying of famine. The lanes of the city were full of the dead bodies of the aged. The children also and young men wandered about the marketplaces like shadows, all swelled with famine, fell down dead wheresoever their misery seized them. As for burying them, those that were sick themselves were not able to do it, and those that were hardy and well were deterred from doing it by the great multitude of those dead bodies. And by the uncertainty there was how soon they should die themselves, for... Many died as they were burying others, and many went to their coffins before the fatal hour was come. Josephus goes on to describe that when the Romans entered the town, they found rooms with entire families of dead persons, and they wouldn't even go into the room. They simply set it on fire. So Jesus, standing from the vantage point of about 33 A.D., is prophesying something 
that the early Christians understood as coming to pass, at least partially so, in 70 A.D. When the Christians began to see the surrounding of the Roman armies around Jerusalem, they took off. And they went to Pella. They went outside the town and escaped. And, of course, Jesus' prophetic words had been open to all, so that in that time there could have been escape. He indicates the need for rapidity in escape by saying, let, those who's, let the person who's on the housetop not go down or enter his house, but let him get out. Don't take anything with him. There's not time to pack. Let the person who's in the field not turn back to get his overcoat, which doubled as his blanket. Let him get going. Alas, for those who are pregnant in that time, or those who are nursing children, for flight becomes exceedingly difficult. Pray that it won't be in the winter because the conditions will be exceedingly cold and it will be difficult to get away. So there's a warning. But then, all of a sudden, in verse 19, we find Jesus literally jumping out of a 70 A.D. setting into an end time setting where he says, For in those days there will be such tribulation as has not been from the beginning of the creation which God created until now and never will be. If the Lord had not shortened the days, no human being would be saved but for the sake of the elect whom he chooses, he shortened the days. What's going on here? Paul talks about this kind of an event in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, where he says that one who exalts himself against God will take him his seat in the temple of God. And he's referring to the Antichrist, who in the end time comes and commits another and final desecration of the temple area. And by the way, the temple has not yet been rebuilt. The Mosque of Omar stands on it today. What is happening through the desecration of the temple under Antiochus Epiphanes and under Titus is a rehearsal for an end time event. Now, our young people now are rehearsing a play which is going to be presented Easter Sunday evening. They're going through it every week. Faithfully rehearsing it. And that rehearsal is an indication that there will come a time when they will put on the final performance. So we should look at prophecy in this kind of a sense. That what we see in terms of previous devastations are rehearsals for something to occur when the final stage is opened and the scene is set. Then there unfolds the drama. And things like that have happened previously in history, but the last setting will be more violent than ever before. We have seen the rehearsals for the Antichrist in persons like Mussolini and Stalin, but there will be a day when there will be a final man appear. We have seen rehearsals for the end of the age in earthquakes and famines and wars and natural disasters, but these culminate in a final display of rebellion against God and human wickedness. Jesus is saying that during that period of time, the believers are to be aware of the fact that persons will arise saying, look, here's the Messiah, or there's the Messiah. But he says, don't believe it. But the temptation of any disciple during that period of time would be to reach out and believe what they can see, to take the physical. Jesus is saying, no, you can't do that. You have, by faith, what the kingdom is. It is not to be felt. It is with physical hands. It is to be felt with the Spirit. You've, I'm sure, like me, read about the Philippine, or the Philipp, uh, I want to say Philippian healers, but I know that's not right. The country of the Philippines. That's right. See, when you get confused, when you're too much in the Bible, you forget modern pronunciations. And I should know the Philippines, but I keep wanting to say Philippi. But anyway, the Philippines healers, you know, with their uh, tremendous uh, ability, evidently, through using... Uh, uh, spiritual mediums of healing to perform operations on people without instruments and all those kinds of things. Now that's the sort of a thing, a sign and a wonder. But it's being performed without, of course, any allegiance to Christ or any involvement with the Messiah. False prophets will be able to do fantastic kinds of things, Jesus is saying. But take heed, Jesus says, I've told you this beforehand. So what has he done? He's given us a kind of a view of the very last segment of man's history in the period of tribulation. Then Jesus goes on in verse 24 to answer the question, what will be the sign of your coming? He says in verse 26, they will see the Son of Man. Matthew in the same passage says, then they will see the sign of the Son of Man. So that is being here described. The sign of His coming. What's it to be like? Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 13, had described what that phenomena would be like. 
Joel in chapter 2 and verse 3, or in chapter 3, had also described what the sign would be like. Now, Jesus restates it, what the prophets had stated. The sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. The power of gravitation, the power of force, the power of energy, uh, the nuclear or thermodynamic power, whatever is involved, those powers are to be shaken in a tremendous catastrophe, the dimensions of which are further seen in Revelation chapter 6, the end of the chapter, in the final imposition of God's judgment on the world. But while that judgment is taking place on the world, then the Son of Man is coming in clouds with great power and glory. The powers of the material universe are being shaken, but the power of the Son of Man is not shaken. It is being released. And what is he doing? Sending his angels out, gathering his elect from the four winds, from the ends of earth to the ends of heaven. Here he's gathering the saints of all the ages who have trusted and believed in him, and he's gathering them to himself. Paul says, then we who are dead, uh, or those who are dead shall be caught up first in the clouds to meet him, and then we who are alive shall be caught up with them, and so shall we be forevermore with the Lord. Some time ago I had a dream that the Lord had come. And that, now there were two dreams in my life about the coming of the Lord. One when I was ten and I had not gone to meet him. And the terror that was in me as a result of that. And then a dream more recently where the Lord returned and I was actually rising to meet him. I can't describe the tremendous liberation that I felt because I think all of us have wondered sometimes deep in our heart, if the Lord came, would I really be ready? Will he accept me? We know doctrinally he will. Yes, we're covered by the blood of Christ. Yes, he's forgiven our sins. But sometimes emotionally, we're not willing to accept what our head knows to be the truth. But I was having something tremendous emotionally happening to me. I was up there to meet him. And I remember uh, looking down from that vantage point and saying to myself, I made it. I made it. The Lord wants us all to have that feeling today. I made it. I made it. The greatest space flight is yet to be when the Lord gathers us to be with Him. You see, once we come to believe in the physical resurrection of the Lord, well then, we're not staggered at all at the prospect of the second coming because He who can arise physically from the dead will also perform His word that He shall come again. So He shall come. Now having said that, Jesus uses some illustrations to help us understand the things which he has just taught. One illustration that he uses is the illustration of the fig tree. From the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts forth its leaves, you know that summer is near. So also, when you see these things taking place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly, I say to you, this generation will not pass away before all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass pass away. Now, it, it would be easy at this point for me to simply forget that verse 30 is there. I say to you, this generation will not pass away till all these things take place and go on without talking about that, but that is really key here to what Jesus is saying and it's been often misunderstood. Some, like Albert Schweitzer, the great humanitarian who served uh, in Africa in a medical capacity, has said, this statement that Jesus said, this generation shall not pass away to all these things be fulfilled, is an example that Jesus was wrong. That as a human being, he erred. That's why Schweitzer said he didn't know who Christ was. He said he comes to us as one unknown. He's a great humanitarian, but he really wasn't sure who Jesus was. And Schweitzer said, he coined you know, the kind of a phrase, he was an unrealized eschatologist which is simply fancy terminology for saying what he believed about the future didn't take place. It was unrealized. It never came to pass. So he was wrong. Now, we should, at this point, take issue with uh, Mr. Schweitzer on the interpretation of that verse, for there are other ways of looking at it which make a tremendous bit of more sense and logic. One way of understanding this has been taught by some now that the generation referred to here is the end time generation, which came into existence when Israel became a nation, that it is the fig tree which is ripened. When that generation comes into being, the Lord will come in that generation. All these things will not pass away. 
Now, I would simply say, let's keep an open mind about this. And if the Lord comes before 1984 or before 1990, then we'll say that was the right interpretation. And we'll all praise the Lord together. But if it's not the right interpretation, let's be aware that there are better understandings of that verse available. One other better understanding is to say that the generation referred to here refers to the Jewish people as a generation. That the word generation, from which we get the word genes in the Greek, refers to a grouping of people. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 23, verse 36, Surely I say to you, he said, all this shall come to pass on this generation. Is referring to the judgment of God, which certainly was not just limited to the people who heard him then, but to the whole generation of man. So Jesus here may be saying, the Jewish people as a unit will not pass away. Now the Hittites are gone, the Hivites are gone, the Philistines are gone, the Pergasites are gone, and the Gergesites are gone, and all the other ites of the Mediterranean world have been swallowed up in other cultures, but the Jewish people have remained. I think we should note that very importantly. Someone once asked a philosopher, can you prove to me the existence of God? And this man happened to be a believer. He said, yes, I can prove to you the existence of God in one word, Jew. God's people have remained. So, there's that possibility. One possibility which I like, and I would advance as perhaps the best, <coughs> since I like it, <coughs> is to understand all these things. This generation shall not pass away to all these things take place. Notice that the things does not include the coming of the Son himself. For Jesus very candidly says in verse 32 that he does not know the time when he will return. And the disciples had asked him in verse 4 of the chapter about the things that are going to take place. And I've defined the things as trouble in religion, trouble in society, trouble in nature, uh, and trouble for the disciples. These things will take place in that generation, in that time span. And we'd have to say, did they? Yes, they did. The early Christians went through tremendous persecution for the faith. They went through famines. There were famines in the Roman world of the first century. They went through earthquakes. And they went through false prophets. So Jesus is simply saying to the disciples, is he not? These things will take place. And as for the fig tree, the fig tree probably best here, rather than being understood as Israel, since Jesus in this context does not identify it as Israel. It is in another place, in another chapter, in a different context. But this time, the fig tree simply refers to the things taking place. The more you see these kinds of things going on, the more you live with the aspect that the day is near. Now, prophecy is a very ticklish business. One who is a prophet must be all right or be totally discredited. And we have to ask of Jesus when we look at this discourse what his credentials are as a prophet. I compare his credentials as a prophet to some data that I gather together on prophecies relating to man's going to the moon, just to show you a contrast between speculation of men and true prophecy. So far as I could find, the first idea written down of the prospect of man's going to the moon goes all the way back to 160 A.D., when a guy by the name of Lucian of Samos had in his book called True History a hero by the name of Acharomenopus take a wing of an eagle and a wing of a vulture and fly to the moon. And he says when he's through with his book, I write of things which I have neither seen nor suffered nor learned from another, things which are not, never would have been, and therefore my readers shall by no means believe them. In other words, I ate spaghetti the night before I had the dream. In the 17th century, a Bishop Godwin, an Englishman, said that his hero, in his story, his hero, Domingo Gonzalez, flew to the moon on a flimsy raft pulled by trained swans. Now, that's one way to go. Kepler, the great scientist in 1643, who discovered the laws governing the motion of planets, had, in his fictional story of going to the moon, demons carry his hero to the moon, and uh, Kepler, being the scientist that he was, put some true data in his story. He postulated that as they left the Earth's atmosphere, they would need sponges because the air up that high would be rarefied. He further suggested that as the journey progressed, there would be no further need for force or for, for propulsion because it would carry its targeted speed once it broke into the upper atmosphere. In the story of Cyrano de Bergiac in 1656, in Voyages to the Moon and Sun, 
A vial of dew is tied around the waist of the hero. The idea being that the sun sucks up dew in the morning. And if you can get enough dew around one person, you can get him up in the air. The trip quite obviously was unsuccessful. Therefore, the next trip involved a flying chariot with firecrackers attached, a little bit more true to form. Jules Verne, in his books From the Earth to the Moon in 1865 and Around the Moon in 1870, had a Columbiad, a colossal cannon that fired adventures from the Baltimore Gun Club into space. It had a 900-foot long vertical barrel which was buried into the Florida ground. It weighed 68,000 tons. It was packed with 400,000 pounds of gun cotton. And its cylindrical shell was made of a new wonder metal aluminum. It had padded walls with inset windows into it. It had hydraulic shock absorbers and even air conditioning, something that in 1865-70 wasn't really around. The cost was only $5.5 million. Jules Verne went on to postulate that not only would the adventure into the moon uh, involved being launched from Florida, but he said America would be the first to do it and three men would go on the journey. <clears throat> well, the stories of Jules Verne and people like H.G. Wells, who in 1901 wrote the book First Men on the Moon, which deeply influenced the scientist, a young boy by the name of Robert Gardard, who was 16 years of age, and in 1926 he set off the first liquid propelled rocket, which uh, managed to rise 41 feet, travel about 184 feet in two and a half seconds, and that was the beginning of the space age. And then there were other people working on fantasies, like Buck Rogers in 1932 began on radio. We had Superman, Flash Gordon. As a kid, I watched Captain Video, and in fact, he, he aired in June 1949 on the DuPont Network with about three and a half million people watching him a half an hour every day. And all of us knew that Captain Video was just fiction. Never would such a thing come to pass. And the leading director of the American space effort, Werner von Braun, in 1961, wrote a book in Reader's Digest. It's in a condensed issue of Reader's Digest in 1961, in which he told a fictional story of, going men, uh, of men going to the moon. And what was so amazing about it is at that time, Werner von Braun knew that we were going to the moon, but he couldn't say it because he knew nobody would believe him. So when he wrote a story about going to the moon, he put it in fiction because nobody in 1961 believed that we were ever going to go to the moon. Now Jesus here, back to the Olivet Discourse, is talking about the future. Now unlike Lucian of Samos and some of the others, he didn't make terribly wild miscalculations. He didn't have the right idea and then get all boggled up in how it was going to be fulfilled. Right from the beginning he says, trouble, 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 trouble. This, 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 and this. And like others who believed in going to the moon that someday man was going to do it, Jesus taught that there is going to be an event that is going to occur in the world, a dissolution of the earth as we now know it, where Peter says the heavens and the earth will melt with a fervent heat and dissolve, and God is bringing in a new age. Jesus is saying this, and he's asked that uh, he be obeyed in this respect, that this is a realm of his teaching which uh, holds to the truth. Now, say what you will, about Jesus of Nazareth, if you do not accept him as Lord and Savior, you will have to say this about him, that for a person, if you only accept him as a Galilean, for a Galilean who was a carpenter from Nazareth, to make that kind of prediction that human history would go the way it's gone, and to have seen human history go the way Jesus forecasted for the last 2,000 years, certainly shows his credentials as a prophet, and gives one the solid reason to believe that inasmuch as what he has said already has come to pass, how much more then we can rely upon his words relating to things which have not yet occurred, namely his coming in clouds of glory. Jesus says in respect to his coming, we are to watch. We are to watch by living our lives and by getting to work. That's the stress of verse 34. Each with his work. But we are to watch also from the standpoint that at any particular time, the Lord could interrupt our routine. The master of the house will come in the evening, at midnight, at cockcrow, or in the morning. Somewhere in the world the sun is always rising, and somewhere in the world it is always setting. So Jesus is saying in this discourse, at some point in the day, wherever you are, in China, in America, in Russia, in England, wherever those time periods are, at some point in someone's day, the Lord himself will come and gather us to be with him forevermore.
He who has this hope in himself purifies himself, is the word of Scripture. That is, this is a guard and a guide to living with an expectancy of the inbreaking of God through Jesus Christ into our time and space. Let's look to him now in prayer. Our Lord, today we thank you for the reality of your word. You not only saw the true dimension of history that when the world as a unit would move away from you, it would gradually come to the birth pangs of a terrible convulsion. You also see that when we, in our individual lives, move away from you, that nothing but destruction and disintegration and agony remains. But when we draw into you, then we are caught up to you. And so we remain with you forever. Your message today, Lord, is a message of life and death to each of us. It is a word of hope to those who have trusted in you. So, Lord, we thank you that we can now look through the scriptures as we have, as we have done this morning and we can see their truthfulness. How over the centuries of time your word has come to pass and is still being performed. And if that's any indication of what you'll do when we open our lives to you, of how your word even there will come true, then we know, Lord, that your word in us will do an effective work. So send your word today, Lord, to us and heal us, I ask. 